Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Coffee Retail Summit. Uh, my name is Kim Elena Ionescu, and I am the Chief Sustainability and Knowledge Development Officer for the Specialty Coffee Association. It's been almost a year since the SCA launched its first Coffee Retail Summit, and honestly, it's difficult for me to compare the circumstances that we're facing now as a coffee industry to those that we faced 10 months ago. I think part of that is the fact that or part of that difficulty can be attributed to the fact that I don't work in retail. I work with the Specialty Coffee Association. Um, and part of that difficulty is due to the uncertainty that characterizes this entire era. But I think that more significant than either of those factors is the diversity factor. As the specialty coffee industry continues to grow, it's more apparent every day that there is no singular approach to or formula for success in this global community. The 2022 Coffee Retail Summit highlights a variety of thought-provoking examples of retail growth and adaptation across three major coffee consuming regions, Europe and the UK, the United States, and Korea. Today, we will explore some of the factors that are impacting coffee retail businesses in the US and in Canada, and I'll use this moment to thank our partners. This iteration of Coffee Retail Summit, uh, the free to attend three-day summit and the associated resource library were made possible with the support of title sponsor Astoria. Uh, thank you also to lead sponsors Simonelli Group and BWT Water and More. Uh, our regional sponsor, Pacific Barista Series, as well as supporting sponsors, Barista, Barazza, and Chemex. So I've already revealed that I don't work in a retail business now, but like many people who work in specialty coffee in the United States, my first job in the coffee industry was as a barista. I worked at the second location of an independent cafe in North Carolina that had only been open for a month or so when I walked in looking for a job. It was owned by two women, one of whom had many years of experience in coffee in other parts of the US, and the two of them had spied an opportunity in the nascent specialty coffee culture and comparatively inexpensive rents presented by the medium-sized city where I live. By the time I left, the business, which was about two years old, was struggling to keep up with the challenges presented by having two stores. We frequently ran out of milk, which resulted in the owner making frantic trips to Costco and me apologizing to frustrated customers looking for cappuccinos. The shop was never profitable enough to have more than one person working behind the bar at any time. And so I got used to the space being either full to bursting with a line to the door and kind customers bringing me empty air pots because I couldn't get out from behind the counter to refresh the filter coffee at the cafe's self-serve station. Or it would be empty enough that I started bringing a book to work for those times when I'd finished cleaning and restocking and I was completely alone in the cafe. Now, oops. Now, Milk outages are not the root cause of an empty cafe, but they were part of the same vicious cycle. The struggles of the cafes also affected the owners. I watched them fall out of love with their business and with each other during my time working for them. And not long after I left, the two of them separated. A year later, they sold their two cafes to two different owners and both ended up leaving the area. I don't know if this story sounds familiar to many of you. It's the story of my experience, but it's certainly not unique. And while the specialty coffee industry has grown by an order of magnitude since 2003, when I walked into that shop looking for my first barista shift, the macro level growth has not made it easy to be consistently profitable at the level of an individual business or even for some chains. Margins were tight and working hours were long even before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. At the Specialty Coffee Association, we do not kid ourselves that we are going to be able to rescue anyone's business, to say nothing of the marriages and other interpersonal relationships that may get inextricably tied up in those businesses. 
but from inside an operation with its long hours, low profit margins and endless tasks, as well as the constant changes that COVID rules and norms require of retailers. It can be hard to tell which problems can be solved by an individual business and which ones require some kind of collective action or outside intervention of some sort. Could those emergency trips my boss was making to Costco have been avoided by hiring a manager for her two stores? Maybe. Would the business have benefited from the greater awareness of and excitement about specialty coffee that would arrive to this area a few years later? Definitely. Should the city have offered financial support to a small retail business like theirs when a construction project to build luxury condominiums downtown made it difficult for their customers to access them? I can't help but wish it had. I wonder what might have been different. Also though, not all businesses need to be rescued. While the past few years have been difficult for many businesses and so many of the people who make them possible, some businesses have grown. Some have thrived and struggled simultaneously, which reveals the fallacy about simple narratives of success. Over the course of this year's Coffee Retail Summit, we will hear from owners, managers, and longtime employees of businesses that are doing everything they can to succeed, including questioning what success looks like for them and whether their goals have changed from what they once were. One of the factors that drove the SCA to launch Coffee Retail Summit in 2021 was the series of surveys on the impacts of COVID-19 on the coffee community that we conducted in 2020 and 2021. We were struck by the high proportion of responses we received from retailers and from roaster retailers. And uh, two of my colleagues talked about this in a, a presentation for last year's Coffee Retail Summit in, in more depth, the whole survey. Um, so while the experiences of these retailers and roaster retailers varied widely, many expressed a common desire to share knowledge and get information that was relevant to them. Uh, it's not that they lacked information, of course, we are all connected online almost constantly, but you know, inspirational stories of businesses pivoting and heart-wrenching stories of businesses closing, they don't necessarily help anyone to understand what options they have, where to make investments, and why certain choices work by some companies than for others. The Coffee Retail Summit and its resource library make it easier to find information that is relevant to coffee businesses. More insights from industry peers and fewer feel-good or feel-bad stories written for the public. The reports that you will find use data about retail trends in aggregate and contextualize those in coffee because it can be difficult to find yourself as an individual or a single business in the macro level. If you are joining us for the first time at this event, whether you are just getting into your business, just getting started, or you have multiple locations and decades invested in your company, I encourage you to use the library to find topics that interest you. By the end of this week, articles and talks, including retail-focused RICO 2021 videos, will be available via the topic highlights or search and filter function under the heading Explore Library. That's the slide I was looking for. We are also excited to release the 2020 US market overview this week, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Um, and it provides an update on the retail value of coffee in the United States. Uh, if you miss any of today's talks, or if you missed all of Monday's talks that were oriented toward the UK and Europe, um, or if you were watching this as a recording, uh, we have recorded everything and um, we are going to be uploading it to our YouTube channel and to this site. So make sure you're on our mailing list to be notified when these recordings are available. Uh, if you're not subscribed already, the best way to do this is to head to retail.sca.coffee slash RSVP to sign up. Our 2022 event consists of three days of programming aimed at audiences in three geographic regions. On Monday, we focused on the UK and Europe. Today, we will shift our review to the US, and on Friday, we will explore retail trends and challenges in the Korean market. This will mark the SCA's first online event for the specialty coffee community in Korea, and all the presentations will be given in Korean. 
So if you are interested in that day's topics and not a Korean speaker yourself, just be patient. Uh, we will subtitle the presentations into English before again, uploading them to this retail.sca.coffee site after the event's conclusion. In planning this year's event, we set out in search of speakers whose experiences reflect some of the greatest challenges and opportunities of, that face retail coffee businesses in 2022. Hiring and training a strong staff team in the midst of the great resignation, as well as building a culture that can support staff development. Pivoting across channels and products to meet your cafe customers at home or in a different aisle of the grocery store. Resilience to supply shortages and using the data available, whether it comes from a report on national consumption trends or a report from your espresso machine. Today, we will hear from Madcap and Gimme Coffee about how they're engaging employees differently now than they did a few years ago. Learn about the retail technology investments made by Cafe Vita, Joe Coffee, and Nemesis Coffee and their impacts on those businesses. And explore product categories adjacent to coffee with Mostra Coffee and Slingshot Coffee. All Coffee Retail Summit presentations will be happening live, and we have built time into every session for questions from all of you. So I hope that you will use the chat window to ask questions of our speakers and share ideas with one another as we pursue a common goal to create a thriving, equitable, sustainable coffee retail segment. Thank you again to our sponsor partners, Astoria, Pacific Barista Series, BWT Water & More, Simonelli Group, Brewista, Chemex, and Barazza. And thank you all for being here with us. Okay, so now I'm going to take off my hosting hat and put on my data hat and talk about the US coffee market in macro terms. I mentioned earlier that we've prepared the 2020 US market overview, and I'm gonna spend the next half hour or so talking about some of the most interesting aspects of that report and of the US coffee retail market generally. So um, as I said, this will be something that we upload this week. You're getting kind of a sneak peek of it on today's, uh, today's presentation. Um, but I'm going to plan to walk through, you know, what is this report? What's the total value? What does that mean? Um, talk a little bit about the sources that we use to put this together, uh, because it is something that is uh, a product of the SCAs. It's not the first year that we've done it. Um, but, uh, but we spend a, a substantial amount of time putting this together, you know, collecting this data and, um, and, uh, and creating this report. So uh, I'll talk about the sources that we use, and then I will do a little bit of a, a comparison between 2020 and uh, 2019, because I think that some of this data is really best understood when you can um, look at one year and, and contrast it with another one, um, especially because, you know, as, as we all know, 2019 and 2020 were, um, were pretty different. Uh, in pretty much all the ways. Um, and that brings me to, you know, the date on this. You might be looking at your calendar or, um, you know, looking at this event's title and saying, well, Kim, it's 2022. Why are we um, looking at coffee market data from 2020? Um, and that is, again, a, a, a function of how we compile this information. So it's, uh, it's not all available at the same time. A number of different um, sources are used. Uh, we look at, uh, at a few different reports to create this one, um, and not all of that data on 2020 becomes available at the same time. So um, we're a little bit behind in terms of, you know, the, uh, the like latest up to the moment trends, but uh, I figure most of you are probably working in coffee yourselves. You have your own day-to-day um, -day experiences. So this is a chance to kind of get out of the, get out of the weeds, um, Get some elevation and look at uh, look at the market in its entirety. Um, so after we go through the report, then we'll get into the um, the analysis and into some of the insights that I think that we can draw from this report. Um, but probably even more than that, they come from all of the source data um, from companies' own uh, filings, from um, you know the the convenience store um, segments you know, the magazines about uh, convenience stores that are part of what we look at when we put this together. Um, and those will focus on, um, you know, the the breakdown between away from home retail and at home retail, 
um, see, you know, what's been lost at the um, in-store level and gained at home. Um, we'll look at the interruption that's happened over the past couple of years, um, you know, 2020 in particular, but 2021 also. Um, and then we can look at the projections. We are too early in 2022 to really have any data that we can uh, look at it really at any level, but especially at any kind of macro level. However, there are, um, you know, there are predictions about uh, about what's going to be happening in, in coffee consumption in the coming years. Um, and we'll see that, you know, the past couple of years have been more a sign of, a, of an interruption than of some kind of like a trend toward the extinction of the coffee industry or specialty coffee. Um, and probably not something that you all were, uh, were worried about in the immediate terms, but we'll talk about it. Um, uh, e-commerce, which almost feels like a cliche at this point to talk about uh, e-commerce, but um, we're talking macro here and, uh, and coffee in the context of, um, of an e-commerce boom that's really not, not in any way limited to coffee. So um, we'll explore that. Uh, then we'll talk about identities and diversification. And I think that um, it's in these later categories uh, or these later topics that we really get into um, some of what's going to be most interesting about the panels that we've put together to, uh, to follow this presentation today. Um, you know, looking at how brands are connecting with consumers um, in different ways than, uh, than they have you know, until recently and what kind of possibilities that opens up um, and then, you know, the possibilities outside of coffee uh, or sort of traditional coffee beverages and um, coffee consumption formats as well. Um, okay, so let's open up the report. We open the, the report and inside we find uh, these two big graphs, uh, or big graphics, and one of them, um, you know, uh, breaks down sales of coffee away from home, and one of them breaks down sales of coffee at home. So in the away from home, this is from the 2020 report. So we're looking at, you know, two different pages of the same year's report. Um, not so much, this is not so much about the comparison between the two of them. I'm just showing them to you at the same time. Um, in away from home, you know, we'll see we have these big categories at the center of this wheel. And that includes, you know, food service and horeca, so hotel, restaurant, catering, um, coffee houses, um, quick service retail. Uh, these are our major categories that include a lot of companies within them, uh, a lot of different brands. Um, if a, a brand or a subcategory is big enough, then it gets its own little chunk sort of sticking off the side. So you can see in coffee houses, um, Starbucks is one of those, a brand that has um, enough you know, uh, retail sales on its own, um, and also whose numbers are publicly available, uh, that we can we can put that in there and sort of show what the what percentage of that coffee house, coffee house total is um, is uh, is represented by Starbucks? Um, within quick service retail, you know, we've got McDonald's, um, donut shops. Within donut shops, there's Dunkin' Donuts. Um, so, you know, you could look at all of this and uh, and sort of maybe place yourself. I imagine again, many people here might be in that coffee house category, um, but maybe not. Maybe you're also uh, interested in you know, uh, office coffee or uh, ready to drink, um, for sure. You know, that's a, a category that's certainly grown in um, in recent years in the United States as a, a percentage of this away from home total. Um, so, and then the, you know, that the value, all those numbers there add up to $71 billion. That's the away from home, um, you know, retail value of coffee in the United States in 2020. Um, and then we add to that the value of coffee at home. Um, so there are some companies here that you'll see appear on both graphs. Um, Starbucks is one of those. You know, Duncan is another one of those uh, brands that have um, coffee that you might, products that you encounter in the grocery store and also, you know, brick and mortar locations. Um, also, you know, that have products in, uh, in vending machines. So they really... You know they they span a lot of them, um, but in the at home uh, on the at home graphic, you see that um, the big breakdown here is like a ground coffee is so much of the um, so much of the total value. You know, I, for me at least, it really puts into perspective how small whole bean really is. Um, it's not that I thought it was so much bigger, but uh, but 
you know, you can see that here. Um, also, I'll take this moment to note that some of these numbers and shapes don't exact, they're not exactly proportionate. So uh, you'd be wise to look at the number and not just judge things by size there. And um, so, you know, like a ground coffee, if you break that down, you've got pods. Um, within those pods, there are a few major company or brands that have been, um, that have been pulled out. And then, uh, you know, standard ground coffee also kind of dominant brands like Starbucks, Folgers that are uh, that are pulled out of this. Um, so you add these things together, you know, and you get the total um, total retail value figure for the United States in 2020. Yeah, in 2020, which is what, like 86 I'm covering my screen here, 86.9 uh, billion dollars. Um, and uh, and for those that might have watched a you know Rico talk or, or seen a study from a few years ago that had a two hundred and twenty five billion dollar figure, um, I want to clarify that when we're talking about this number, this is um, you know this is the the retail coffee figure, which doesn't include things like you know job creation, which would have been part of that um, total impact of the U.S. coffee industry. Um, summary and, and report that uh, the SCA was a part of along with the National Coffee Association and I think it was 2015. So just in case someone was like, oh my God, what happened? We lost like two thirds of our value in five years. COVID's killing our industry. And um, that was a different report and a different way of calculating those figures. Um, so this is this is still big though. You know, I see this and I, I know that probably for um, many people it's like, it's abstract in this uh, in this form. And if you already have a coffee business, then, you know, it might just be sort of an interesting abstraction. But if you are thinking about opening a coffee business, for example, and wondering, um, you know, how to break down the different, um, the, uh, and, and wondering sort of how to break down or how to see yourself in the landscape then something like this could help you sort of orient to who the players in the landscape are. Um, I think also uh, this is the kind of information that for anyone who is trying to see coffee in, you know, as a, a subset of or one industry as part of an even larger, um, like a world of retail or in the context of even bigger trends, that it's a it's macro to us as specialty coffee, but um, it's still a way of uh, contextualizing, you know, coffee specifically versus coffee and food and you know um, commodities and all of the other factors that might play into uh, some of the reports that would be available online um, from a, a major um, you know data collection source like your monitor or Nielsen or I have a slide in here later from McKinsey. Um, so this is the uh, this is the U.S. coffee retail market. Uh, this will be available um, free to download. It'll be part of this um, this resource library. Um, okay, so we'll go from what it is and uh, and how to use it, how to read it, into um, how we put it together. So um, we compile this report every year. As I said, it takes a little while because we have. A number of different um, sources for data that uh, that feed into it, um, but I've taken that small print at the bottom of each of one of those pages and blown it up so that you can you know see a few examples of the uh, of the data sources. And I think that this kind of information is um, I think of it as being like the kind of this is a slide for people who when they're reading scientific journal articles are really interested in the methodology section. Now we'll open it up and maybe before they read the introduction, but certainly before they get into the sort of conclusions or discussion, want to know how someone arrived at the conclusions they arrived at. Um, so if you're one of those people, if you read scientific journal articles that way, um, if you just wanna know, you know, what information or what, what data we used, um, you could find a lot of this not all of it, but uh, um, but you know a lot of this is publicly available, and you could dig into these numbers. And if you did that, you might arrive at a different um, conclusion for some of these numbers, and um, and that's okay. You know, this is a uh, this is like a 
Starbucks in a, a slide that I'll show later is listed as a quick service restaurant. So um, we are doing some, we are making some choices with this and trying to present as accurate a snapshot as we can. Um, but if you, uh, like I said, if you are motivated to dig in, um, I'd love to know uh, what sort of differences people who um, who present this information differently, um, what alternative interpretations would be. Um, we put this out there in hopes that it will be a, uh, a useful resource. Um, and if there are ways to improve it, then, uh, then I'd love to know. Um, so that's how we put the, uh, the report together. Some of the sources, if you want to, um, if you want to dig into those. Um, next, I'll get into the comparison of 2019 to 2020. Um, so in each of the, in the next couple of slides, I'll have the 2019 figure and then juxtapose it in the same, um, the, the same graph from the 2020 report. Uh, so um, we'll start with away from home, um, imagining again that many people here have some part in a business that uh, serves customers outside their homes. Um, uh, the away from home coffee market in 2019 was, as you can see, larger uh, in terms of total sales. And then the retail, uh, the away from home market was in 2020. Um, and, you know, given the impact of COVID, what we saw, lived through, I think it's probably not surprising to, um, to most people that, uh, that there was this, um, you know, that we saw this shock. And it's not, you know, even at the macro level, it's not insignificant to lose what, like close to $8 billion out of a, an $80 billion dollar um, total. Um, at the individual level, of course, you know, that meant the closure of a lot of businesses and the loss of a lot of, of a lot of jobs. Um, so this is a, um, a shift that, you know, maybe if you look at the two graphics, they look relatively the same, but I don't want to, um, to gloss over the, the fact that, you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of business. Um, I also don't want to, you know, uh, ignore the fact or, or dwell there and not look at how that loss was, um, was absorbed by the coffee industry, by the away from home um, segment of the coffee industry. Uh, because when I look at this, I see that the, um, the losses, at least to me, it was surprising to see that they were sort of, um, they were spread. Uh, so in these central categories, coffee houses, food service, and Horeca, quick service re retail. You know, you see um, some pretty significant losses in food service in Horeca and coffee houses, um, pretty evenly split there. Um, there are, uh, you know, the numbers go down sort of across the board. But I also thought it was, you know, interesting to note that um, of these sort of three major categories, uh, quick service retail, actually didn't see um, the same sort of impact that coffee houses and uh, and food service did and um, and wondered if you know maybe there's fodder there for another another talk I'm not going to have time to um, to dig into it today nor honestly do I have the uh, the expertise in quick service retail um, I actually looked into uh, what that meant just to make sure before um, I started like preparing for this talk that I um, was thinking about the right thing so uh, these are the top 15 quick service retail or quick service restaurants in the United States in 2020. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, you know, seeing Starbucks as number two on here does make me think about the uh, the coffee house thing and just, you know, again, remind me that um, in this report, as in all uses of data, there is some uh, some interpretation that goes along with it and, and some choices that we uh, make along the way. Um, so uh, quick service retail did not have the same kind of, uh, of impact um, that coffee houses and food service did. Um, at home, you know, you see the, uh, the opposite in terms of growth loss, um, where the uh, away from home coffee consumption was, or retail value was um, negatively impacted. We had a boost in at home sales. And um, again, I think this is recently enough that it's probably not surprising to uh, to most of us, but now we see it kind of quantified in economic terms. So 
um, got about a, a $2 billion increase, which is not as much as the uh, $9 billion, $8 billion loss from the away from home. But um, but it's also not insignificant because, you know, a jump from 14 to 16 is a more than 10% increase in a, a single year. Um, likewise, I think that if you look at this and are sort of looking for where the growth happened, um, it was pretty evenly spread uh, between different at-home uh, sub-channels also. So uh, while at the beginning of the pandemic, I think many of us believed or hoped that this um, sourdough bread making, growing scallions on our windowsills um, trend was going to result in more people investing in really good coffee brewing equipment at home and uh, taking time and uh, and really celebrating their coffee and you know, buying whole bean coffee, I, that didn't end up being so much the case. Um, you know, we saw the the growth more evenly spread across um, all of the different formats, including the more sort of standard ground coffee format and uh, and pots, of course. So um, that's that, that first um, insight that, you know, I wanted to make sure to emphasize here in the, um, in the comparison was that uh, we have seen this loss in um, the out of home retail, but we've seen that some of that result in, you know, gains in the home, including for some of the same brands. Um, so the you know, the next uh, slide that I have has a, a quote um, that I found actually just yesterday from a, um, Beverage Daily, uh, the CEO of Nestle talking about how um, they see their company as uh, as benefiting even while they're losing in uh, away from home um, coffee sales. So he talks about the at home revolution. You know, uh, Coffee to me is the signature category to benefit from what I call the at-home revolution. Um, talking about people, you know, being at home because they are working from home, being at home because they have uh, been part of the Great Resignation. Um, but uh, that looking long term, you know, while they may lose a cup of coffee out of home, they stand to benefit um, from the development which they believe is is here to stay. So um, that's a, a very large company, these are large numbers, but I think that there are, um, you know, there are definitely implications for that or for small businesses also. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, hearing more about that later as we hear from people who are in retail and have been making these choices over the past, uh, over the past couple of years. Um, so the next uh, of these, you know, insights that I wanted to offer based on the data that's in the um, market overview and also the the source data is that um you know while we've seen this interruption at the macro level to coffee um consumption out of home it seems like you know this is a an interruption and not an extinction not a, a long-term um you know uh not a long-term decline to be prepared for. Uh, so these two graphs come from the US and, and fresh coffee beans um, is, you know, like a sort of a proxy for like coffee that you buy at the grocery store, whole bean coffee. Um, and then we have the, uh, the shop consumption, which is broken up into chains and independent. So chains is the orange line uh, that's higher up on that graph, and then independence is the gray line down toward the bottom. Um, and with both of these, we actually get into the territory of projecting. And that's where I think, um, you know, the, uh, the hope for the future comes in. Because while we have data for um, the grocery segment, that's up until you know, 2021, and we can see that there was a, a spike between 2019 and 2020, which corresponds to those last um, graphs we were looking at, where the at-home numbers increased. You know, more people were buying fresh coffee beans in 2020 significantly. It was a a, a real boost to what had been already an upward trend. Um, then we saw that sort of level out, and in 2021, presumably people, some of them went back to going out for their coffee instead of brewing coffee 
at home, um, maybe using the nice coffee maker that they had uh, they had bought during the first few weeks of the pandemic, um, because that was one of the uh, you know the things that we've we've learned or seen um, in, in terms of a lot of growth. You look at the uh, home appliance segment and uh, coffee brewers as a part of that. So um, in 2021, people started going back out for coffee, and uh, that pace of growth did not um, was not sustained. But um, if you look at 2022, or we get into projections, you know, you see the number continues to increase. Um, the amount of fresh coffee that is being purchased and uh, and consumed at home, um, and that growth trend, that trend line is you know not so different than it was from 2018 to 2019. So and it looks like we're getting back, we're getting back on track. Um, and the same thing is true if you look at the uh the away from home consumption numbers you see that in this case from 2018 you know 2019 to 2020 that's when you get this decrease that um if you put them these two graphs over each other you'd see that you know like retail away from home goes down retail um for at home goes up in the same time and then they sort of switch back so uh so that number went way down in 2020 for chains, uh, and less so for independent shops. You know, the the decline was not as um, as pronounced. Um, and then in 2021, it starts to grow again, and then we're projecting that by 2024 or thereabouts, it's pretty much back to where it would have been um, had the pandemic not interrupted the um, the yeah interrupted these businesses. So for those that survived um, and that continue to survive and thrive, you know, this is uh, this is what the the projection for the future looks like. Um, uh, and then uh, because we happen to have data for Canada, which uh, is not included in the U.S. market report, but we do have a, a panelist today from uh, from Canada and um, and I presume probably some audience members who are living in working in Canada. Um, I thought I'd share the uh, the corresponding figures for Canada as well. So um, you can see that in Canada, the uh, the impacts were a little bit more severe in both cases. You know, the um, the growth between 2020 and 2021 for fresh coffee beans was also you know really dramatic. But um, then the kind of falling off and and releveling. Um, it was a, a sharper increase and a sharper decrease, uh, and especially for the away from home and the impacts on on chains and uh, independent businesses too. Um, that uh, that drop in 2020 was sharper, um, so it will take longer, according to the projections, um, to get back on on the sort of same growth track that it was on prior to the pandemic. Okay, so that's number two. So we talked about retail uh, at home and uh, and away from home. Um, then uh, you know this is being an interruption, not a case of a long term decline. Um, and now we'll talk about e commerce, which, as I said before, you know I know we all we all know about this. We all read articles. We're connected constantly, as I said in my uh, in my introduction. Um, but I think that uh, that I would be remiss if I didn't talk about e-commerce because um, at the individual level, the business or chain level, I think that it's a um, it's a strategy that we've seen a lot of uh, of businesses turn to. Um, in some cases, early on in the pandemic, out of necessity, as a way to uh, connect during a during a lockdown or um, during a time when um, there wasn't sufficient staff or people didn't feel safe. Uh, selling coffee online was a way to reach the customers that you already had and keep them. Um, but I also think that, you know, it's been an interesting way, and, and I hope to hear about this from some of the uh, panelists, to reach customers maybe outside of your home geographic region. Um, you know, I know for me, the idea of a, a neighborhood cafe still has a lot of, um, you know, emotional resonance with me. Um, but that uh, when companies begin to sell coffee online, you know, e-commerce, um, not just uh, coffee, but equipment, you can reach a different group of customers and, um, and potentially, you know, expand your, your reach that way. Um, so for this graph here, just you know, to make use of the, uh, the image that I chose, uh, you can see the United States on the top line there with a 3.3 growth of 
3.3 times as fast in 2020 as the um, average rate had been between 2019, between 2015 and 2019. So for those four years, um, e-commerce had been growing at about 1.4% per year. Um, and then in 2020, we've got this spike and suddenly it's growing you now like four point, what is that? 4.6% in a, a single year. Um, and that's you know consistent with other markets also. Um, some that have grown faster, some that started from a higher baseline like China, um, but it's a reflection of consumer behavior that's broader than just coffee and broader than um, just the United States. Um, so that example of customers, uh, you know, finding brands that they might not have found if they were just looking in their neighborhood um, brings me to this next opportunity uh, that's characteristic of of this time that we are currently in and um and i, I want to talk about it in terms of identities um uh, for those of you that are you know maybe some of you are watching on sca's youtube channel now maybe you've watched other uh, videos on our youtube channel in 2019 um there was a session at the rico symposium called letting go of sameness and um that session was all about emerging markets and not just emerging markets in like the context of a country that had not historically been a coffee consuming country and is now beginning to uh, embrace coffee or or specialty coffee um but even so like emerging markets or uh, or you know, groups of coffee drinkers within the United States who had been ignored or um, or underserved by uh, by specialty coffee, and you know, now about three years later, I would say that um, it's pretty clear to me that we have we have let go of sameness, and some of the um, the brands that have gotten the most attention over the past few years are brands that really um, you know identify with the or that lead with attributes that are not about the specific flavor characteristics of a coffee, um, or in some of these cases that actually don't have a, a, a brick and mortar store. Um, you know, I, I know this is Retail Summit, and and most of the time when we talk about retail in the U.S., we are talking about you know a, a storefront, or historically we would have been uh, versus e-commerce. Um, but I think that all three of these brands um, are ones to pay attention to. Uh, first, Nguyen Coffee is a um, you know, proudly Vietnamese American coffee company serving coffee that it, uh, selling coffee that's sourced from Vietnam, uh, both Arabica, um, you know, sort of signaling traditional specialty coffee as we have become accustomed to defining it, but also uh, Robusta and not um, with any kind of a, apology and no hiding about that just you know celebrating that robusta has um you know uh, uh flavor characteristics um product again like uh, valuable attributes things that make um special and uh and appealing to customers who you know are interested in um not just what vietnam is growing but also you can see this fin filter here which is a brewing device so they're really embracing not just vietnam vietnam's coffee growing culture but vietnam's coffee consuming culture um and social justice is a big part of their brand also um so all of these uh combine together to create a brand that has um you know a, a very particular identity and is connecting to maybe multiple elements of the or multiple identities of their uh of their customers beyond what might have been sort of a, a traditional specialty coffee cares a lot about the flavor of uh, of coffee and maybe you know how that coffee was sourced um, archetype. Uh, Black and Bold is another one of these companies. Um, uh, none of these is new as of the the pandemic, but all of them have experienced a lot of growth in the past couple of years. Um, so Black and Bold, you know, Middle America company started in Iowa, um, but then. In the um, in the context of the you know, Black Lives Matter movement of 2020, and since then, this brand has experienced a, a really really rapid growth. And I use this image because um, last year, toward the end of 2021, that they were the first Black-owned 
beverage company to sign a licensing agreement with the NBA. Uh, they also have a, a partnership with Ben and Jerry's and a, a Ben and Jerry's ice cream flavor. Um, so, you know, they're really sort of capturing, speaking to, um, they're representing a, a segment of the population and, and coffee drinkers and consumers um, who have been uh, waiting for a brand to, you know, speak to one or, or more of their identities. Um, and then finally, Black Rifle Coffee Company, which um, is from the data that I have been looking at, you know, there is, is the 12th largest brand um, in terms of retail sales percentage uh, in the United States in 2020. Um, and, you know, it's only 1.6%, I think, of the uh, of the market, which might not sound like a lot. And I might be off a little bit in that, but it's one point something. So, you know, 1.6%. Um, and that might not sound like a lot until you look at the brands that are behind that. And that includes like Cafe Bustelo and Seattle's Best Coffee Company. So there are some um, some really you know large and familiar household brands that are um, behind this one, which is, um, you know, uh, leaning into this military veteran um, uh, identity and, and speaking to a whole set of coffee drinkers that um, I think, you know, arguing could be argued that specialty coffee has not reached um, particularly well. So these are three examples. There are so many more. Um, I think that uh, this will be probably better covered by some of the uh, the speakers that we've invited to share their stories and their perspectives in the subsequent panels than um, than I could possibly cover it today. Um, so uh, these are these are a few good examples. Um, then the last thing that I wanted to talk about is this idea of diversification. I know I'm running up against the end of my time and uh, and I could really talk about uh, interesting things in coffee all day long. Um, but uh, and I'm calling this sort of like coffee and and I've used a picture of mushrooms here because, um, you know, of all of the different uh, flavor combinations or additives to coffee that I have become accustomed to seeing, you know, I've been working in coffee for 20 years. I've been part of coffee competitions before. I think like, you know, interesting flavors. I'm, I'm into that stuff. Um, but uh, but I probably would not have imagined how much I would be hearing and reading about uh, coffee and mushroom adaptogens, you know, things that are uh, really kind of walking the line between coffee as a health supplement, not just because it has antioxidants, as we know from the many studies that have been done um, over uh, over decades, um, but as sort of a, a vehicle for other um, compounds and other, uh, yeah, just other means of pursuing goals of better health, a sort of more natural way of balancing um, the body's systems. So whether it's collagen or adaptogens um, or just, uh, you know, um, turmeric lattes or things that uh, that maybe have come from a kind of flavor world and, and dabbled in the, the health world. This seems like um, something that is uh, that is a product of this time that we are in. And um, while it doesn't come out in any of the uh, segments in the U.S. market trends report, it's something that I'm certainly paying attention to. Um, and again, a, another reason I think that it's pertinent to include it now, even if it doesn't feel like this is really a thing yet, is because, you know, a few years ago, we were having these arguments about whether or not cold coffee, ready to drink coffee, you know, where that sat in the hierarchy or in the um, the world of specialty coffee. And uh, at this point, I think that, you know, we've, we've put that discussion to bed and whether or not an individual likes a particular coffee brand or a particular uh, format for drinking coffee. You know, there are cold coffees abound and um, and the uh, coffee, especially the coffee community is richer for the, um, the you know, diversity in product formats and uh, and different ways of reaching customers that we, we now have. Um, so I just wonder if we're going to be in the same uh, situation a few years from now um, as we talk about coffee and mushroom products. Uh, and the like. Um, so, uh, as I said, you know, conscious of how many great 
uh, perspectives we have brought together for today's event, uh, representing companies on the larger side and the smaller side that are um, have been brick and mortar until the pandemic, um, companies that have always been strong at sales online and into grocery. And uh, I am looking forward to uh, to hearing more from them about all of these topics. Um, and just because I've you know I've given this presentation that has a lot of optimism in it, um, I want to acknowledge that each of these trends, uh, each of these opportunities for gain at home, you know, the um, the projection for growth, uh, the potential for e-commerce and the growth there, all of these new identities and, and ways in which brands can connect to consumer identities, the diversification of coffee into other products, um, these collaborations or uh, or new new channels, ways of reaching uh, ways of reaching customers and different aisles of the grocery store. You know, I know that this is balanced by um, some really substantial challenges too, uh, and they're not a, a one for one. But you know, a lot of people are at home because they have not had the option to go into a an office. Um, some people are at home because working is particularly challenging. Um, in this uh this moment in time and so that's part of the great resignation that changes our who our customers are um, and what they're looking for from us and that it also changes uh what we are capable of um in within our own organizations and, and our our staffing and support for our employees um you know the pandemic rudeness i was looking for a way to uh to characterize this and i didn't come up with this uh phrase there may be other ones um but this one seemed like a uh yeah it seemed like a phrase that was used enough and didn't have any um you know curse words in it that would have to be edited out afterwards so i'll use this to describe the um change in the dynamic between you know, hospitality workers and um, and customers. Um, for as much as we celebrate customers, these are these are challenging times to say the least. Uh, supply shortages, which is a topic we uh, talked about at length at Green Coffee Summit a few months ago. Um, but you know, green coffee and coffee retail are um, you know these things are are tied together, and we don't really have one without the other. Um, even the identities piece of this with the political. Um, the flip side of of the uh, strong identities that um, individuals can develop or, or brands can develop to um, connect to one another, you know, it can be difficult to bridge these identities and find kind of a, a common ground in a, a very politically polarized time. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, this diversification. While we have the chance to look at different formats and different products. We also have, um, you know, maybe different uh, um, different competitors uh, looking at coffee and seeing um, ways in which to uh, enter this market and uh, and innovate in this market. And so there's a, there are things, you know, to be aware of, um, benefits and drawbacks, opportunities and challenges. Um, there's always a, a balance. Um, so, that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation. I know I'm bumping right up against the hour mark and I see there are a couple of um, questions that have come in. So I will see if I can answer uh, one of them quickly before we have to you know, wrap me up and get me off the stage in order to get the next panel um, uh, set up to, uh, to come online. Um, but I will also be in the in the chat, you know, I, I will be um, available and I will do my best to answer any other questions um, and share resources and, uh, you know, boost our speakers and stuff for the remainder of, um, of today. Um, so I see a question, is the gain loss from at home versus in home, sorry, I'm moderating for myself, so I have to read it out loud, uh, versus in home evenly distributed for small businesses compared to giants like Nestle? Um, you know, that is not a question that I'm going to be able to answer from the data that we have access to. I would say that, um, you know, the, I don't even have data for the Nestle uh, 
portion of that. I have that quote from um, uh, an article yesterday. So in that person's estimation, you know, this is a this is an opportunity, and I use that and I present that as sort of a signal for, um, you know, if this person, if this business with the resources that they have, uh, sees opportunity here, then, um, you know, it suggests that there would be opportunity not just for them, you know, um, because they do have analysts, teams of analysts at all of the different levels of their business, whether they're forecasting, um, you know, coffee availability or whether they are, uh, you know, um, doing studies on consumer behavior. So I think that that's one of the ways in which we can uh, we can take the um, you know, shared perspective of this giant and then say, okay, like, what does that mean for me? Is this, um, if this is true, then um, how would I, in the context of my business, uh, seek to gain some of that at home market share so that it's, you know, a net win for me as well, even if um, I recognize that I am going to lose some of the customers that I, or I have lost some of the customers that I have uh, in my my retail shop. Uh, so I don't see this as like a, an endorsement of shuttering a, a shop and going to, you know, pick up only automation or e-commerce only. Um, but I do think that it uh, it is secure enough that um, once it makes it to the popular press um, or the sort of industry press, that uh, it's it's worth us paying attention to. But, I, you know, I can't say that um, it would be evenly distributed. Um, I can only look back with the data and say that in the 2019-2020, um, if we compare those two years, that the losses were across categories more evenly distributed than I had expected. Um, and so while for a small business, there are a lot of small businesses that were lost in that uh, time, and those were individual businesses versus locations of a Starbucks. Um, I do think that that bodes, that there is a, uh, it bodes well for the, um, you know, the ability of small businesses to adapt. And I'll just put one more plug in for the, uh, the results of that COVID survey um, also suggest, um, and the video that, um, that we have in the resource library about the, the survey series, um, suggest that small businesses were more resilient and better able to adapt because of the uh, ability to you know, be nimble and go from idea to implementation more rapidly than uh, larger chains were. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. Um, I'll thank you all again for being here. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Um, and I look forward to uh, chatting with all of you and hearing from our presenters.